continuing in our study through the book of Romans. We're up to Romans chapter 15, verses 25 to 33. And if you were here last Sunday, you'll know that we are pretty much on what we're calling the home stretch in terms of what Paul is writing to the Christians in Rome. In fact, what Paul is really doing from, you know, last week's passage right through into the end of Romans um, chapter 16, all he's really doing, he's bringing this letter to the Romans to a close. And he's doing so by sharing some personal thoughts about his ministry. And he's doing so by sharing certain personal um, greetings to other believers that he knew in Rome. Now, as we mentioned last week, as we've looked at dividing that second half of Romans chapter 15, we've divided it into two sermons. One last week, one here today. But although we've divided it into two sermons, there is one primary theme, there's one central theme in this passage, and that is simply the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is the main theme. That is the main idea. And this is what we've seen, haven't we? All Paul is doing in this, this final section in his letter to the Romans is that he's sharing thoughts, personal thoughts about his ministry. He's sharing personal thoughts about his future plans and what he plans to do. But it's all focused on this central idea, the central motivation of his life, which is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, last week we looked at two headings, gospel ministry and gospel ambition. Gospel ministry was found in verses 14 to 19, and Paul's gospel ambition in verses 20 to 24. Whereas in today's study, verses 25 to 33, right to the end of chapter 15, well, we're dividing that into two main headings as well. We're going to see firstly in verses 25 to 29, we're going to see gospel partnership. This is where Paul talks about gospel partnership. And then finally from verses 30 to 33, we're going to see gospel prayer. So we've looked at gospel ministry and gospel ambition. That was last week. Whereas today, gospel partnership and gospel prayer. In this study, we're going to be challenged. We're going to be, think, be challenged to think about our partnership with other Christians. We're going to be challenged to think about our partnership with other uh, churches outside of our church. But we're also going to be challenged when it comes to our intercessory prayer and our intercessory prayer life as individuals and as a church when it comes to other gospel ministries in which other believers are involved in. And so let's, with this introduction out of the way, let us give our attention by looking to see what Paul has to say in verses 25 to 29. And again, what is the main heading? The main heading here is gospel partnership. Notice how Paul begins. If you notice it there, right in your Bibles in verse 25, Paul says, But now I am going to Jerusalem to minister to the saints. Now, if you were here last week, you'll realize just how surprising this statement sort of takes us and how surprising it is when we read this, this intro statement here in, in verse 25. The statement that Paul makes in verse 25, it, it almost takes us off guard, especially in light of what it is that Paul has been saying leading up to this verse. After all, what was he talking about leading up to this verse? Well, in verses 20 to 24, Paul has just been finishing off talking about his gospel ambition. He's, speaking, he's been talking about his desire to take the gospel of Jesus Christ to those who had never heard it before. And so he planned to briefly pass through Rome only very briefly because Paul wants to go and he wants to take the gospel to Spain. This is what he's been thinking about. This is what he's been talking about. I want to take the gospel, he says, to regions that have never heard the name of Jesus Christ. And so that's where he, that was the lead in coming up to verse 25. And then we get to verse 25, and, and what does Paul say? Well, he says that he's planning on going in the opposite, very opposite direction. He says, I'm going to come to you, I'm going to go to Spain. But then verse 25, he says, well, I'm going to go in the opposite direction. I'm actually going to be going first to Jerusalem. So what's more, we're seeing here that Paul is not going to Jerusalem to, for evangelistic purposes necessarily. After all, in Jerusalem, Jerusalem was a place where Christ had already been named. A foundation had already been laid within Jerusalem. But instead, we see that he's going not for, for gospel proclamation. The purpose of Paul first going to Jerusalem is gospel partnership. 
gospel partnership. You see, what he's planning to do and going to Jerusalem, it is, he's going to be taking a much-needed collection of money from all the surrounding Gentile churches around, and he's going to be taking it to the believers in Jerusalem who were poverty-stricken at that particular time. Notice how Paul puts it in verse 26. He says there in verse 26, For it pleased those from Macedonia and Achaia. That's talking about Gentile churches that are around the region. It pleased them to make a certain contribution for the poor among the saints who are in Jerusalem. So this is the purpose. This is the reason for why it is that he's going. You see, at that time, not only was there a famine in Palestine, but the Jewish Christians who were in Jerusalem at that time, they were being severely persecuted, not just by Gentiles, not just by Romans, but they were being se severely persecuted by fellow Jews who were not Christians. And they were being persecuted by fellow Jews because of their faith in Jesus Christ. Jewish Christians were being fired from their jobs by non-Christian Jew, Jewish employers. So if you're a Christian, your Jewish employer was going to fire you if they weren't a Christian. Non-Christian Jews were refusing to do business with Christian Jews so that Christian Jews who were in business, they were no longer able to make a living in the way in which they once did from their trades, their services, their products, and so forth. And what's more, many Jewish uh, Christian Jews, they were being carted off to prison at that time because of their faith in Jesus Christ. And this was resulting, all of this is resulting in a huge financial strain on Christian homes, and it was resulting in a huge financial strain within the Christian church right there in Jerusalem. And it's for this reason, Paul takes it upon himself. He sees the need, he sees the persecution, he sees the financial need in Jerusalem at that time, and Paul takes it upon himself to start a financial collection from the surrounding Gentile churches so that he could bring this combined financial gift to the Christians in Jerusalem who were suffering financially because of the persecution that was coming against them because of their faith in Christ. Now, Paul talks about this in a number of places throughout his New Testament letters. One of the places he talks about this collection that he was, this financial collection from Gentile churches to bring to, the, to those in Jerusalem. One of the places is in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 1 to 3. And this is what he says as he's talking to the Corinthians about collecting a, fini a financial gift for the believers in Jerusalem. He says, Now concerning the collection for the saints, he says, As I have given orders to the churches of Galatia, so, uh, so you must do also. And he says, On the first day of the week, let each of you lay something aside, storing up as he may prosper, that there be no collection when I come, he tells them. And then he says, When I come, whomever you approve by your letters, I will send to bear your gift to Jerusalem. But not only do we have this passage here where he's talking about it in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, Paul devotes two entire chapters to talking about this financial gift to the believers in Jerusalem. It is in 2 Corinthians chapters 8 and 9. So if you ever in your spare time, you want to understand a little bit more about this, have a look at 2 Corinthians chapters 8 and 9, where he talks extensively around this financial gift for the believers in Jerusalem. Now, what are we getting at? What, what are we getting here? Well, needless to say, needless to say, for how much Paul talks about it, for how much time he's giving to it, needless to say, this financial collection for the, the Christians and the Jewish Christians in Jerusalem, this was very important to the Apostle Paul. So much so that he was prepared to hit the pause button on his evangelistic efforts in Spain in order to collect and in order to deliver this financial gift to the believers in Jerusalem. Now, on one hand, we look at this and we go, We'll give you a little bit of an applaud. Well done, Paul. Thank you, Paul, for, your, for your, your benevolent humanitarian efforts in supporting the poor people in Jerusalem. Let's give you an applaud. That's on one hand. However, there was something more that Paul hoped to achieve. There was something more that Paul had in mind when pulling together this combined financial offering. And can I just say this? It was more than just a loving humanitarian effort. It was more than that. 
How do we know that? Well, he gives us a clue in verse 26. Notice in your Bibles there in verse 26, the word that's translated in the New King James Version is the word contribution. It's pleased them to make this contribution. You see, the Greek word contribution here, it is more than just getting that $2 coin and going and popping it in the bucket of that street person as you're walking by them through cash or mall or so forth. It's, it's more than that. The word encompass, encompasses more than just, here you go, I'll dump a coin in the bucket. But instead, the word contribution, in the Greek, it's the, the, the word that many of us would know, koinonia. It's a word that is, is translated more often than not within our New Testament as the word fellowship. Sometimes it's trans, translated as the word communion. It speaks of sharing close, intimate relationship with another believer that is more than just an acquaintance. It's more than just dumping that coin in a bucket and going, there, 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 I did my good Christian deed for the day. I've dumped a coin within the bucket. No, it's more than just that. It's talking about something rich. It's talking about something, something that, that's closer, an intimate relationship with one believer to another. Now, <clears throat> this is the way the Gentiles were seeing, the Gentile Christians were seeing their contribution, the financial gift to the believer's in Jerusalem. Now, what is this telling us? What is it telling us? Well, it's telling us that Paul's motive in arranging this financial gift for the believers in Jerusalem, it was not only to help them practically, but in addition to helping them practically, his motive was to strengthen the fellowship between Jew and Gentile believers spiritually. In other words, the practical support was a means to an even greater end. And that greater end was togetherness or partnership between fellow believers from different backgrounds. After all, as we read through the book of Acts, we see that there were a number of Christian Jews who really, really struggled. They struggled with the fact that Gentiles or non-Jews could be brought into the fold of God's blessing through faith. They struggled with that. To, to the Jewish thinking in that day, they saw non-Jews, they saw Gentiles as being fuel for the fires of hell. That's how it is that they thought about non-Jewish people. And so, as God revealed to them the extent of the gospel, the extent of God's grace, that it would come and, and be bestowed upon both Jew and Gentile, that they could both be justified by faith, as they come to realize that that middle wall of separation between Jew and Gentile, had now been torn down by the blood of Christ, making peace between these two people groups. Well, for the Jews, the Jews, this was a very difficult truth for many of them to come to grips with. And yet again, Paul's hope, Paul's hope in gathering this partnership, this, this, this fellowship, this, this financial gift that he would put together from Gentile churches, his hope was that this material gift would also serve as a means to cultivate spiritual fellowship and spiritual togetherness between Jew and Gentile. And what's more, notice next in verse 27, this is something that the Gentile believers were more than happy to do. Notice how he puts it there in verse 27. He says, it pleased them. In other words, it pleased the Gentile churches. It pleased those, those ones in Macedonia and Achaia and so forth. It pleased them and they are their debtors, talking about debtors to the Jewish Christians in Jerusalem. For, it says in verse 27, if the Gentiles have been partakers of their spiritual things, their duty is also to minister to them in material things. What is Paul saying there? What do you see that Paul, what idea is Paul wanting to get across from what it is that he's communicating there to them, uh, us, in verse 27? Well, on a purely human level, all Gentile believers owed their spiritual lives to the Jewish apostles, to the Jewish prophets, to the Jewish teachers, to the Jewish evangelists who dispersed from Jerusalem proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. On a purely human level, they owed those Jewish people for their labors, for their work. On a purely human level, the scriptures were written through and preserved by 
the Jewish people. The promises of salvation were originally given to the Jews. The Messiah himself, Jesus Christ, he came from the human descent of the Jews. By faith, Gentiles are now grafted into the spiritual blessings, you know, that would be that, that God gave originally to the Jews. And so from a purely human point of view, Paul speaks about the, 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 the Gentile Christians being somewhat indebted to the Jews, spiritually speaking, and that, that this would serve as somewhat of a motivation to help these ones out materially. As for Paul, what was his role in this? What was Paul's role? He wants the, the bonds of unity to be put between Jew and Gentile. He wants to help a practical need, but he also sees a deeper spiritual need of seeing a togetherness of one people of God, not two fractured peoples of God. For Paul, he saw his role in this as the one who would seal or the one who would validate this incredibly important financial gift from the Gentiles. Or as he says there in verse 28, notice how he puts it. He says, therefore, when I have performed this and have sealed to them this fruit, in other words, to validate what it is that has been brought to them, he then says, I shall go by way of you to Spain. In other words, Paul wanted to make sure that the Jewish Christians in Jerusalem, that they truly understood the significance of this gift. He wanted to go and take it in person so he could validate it, so that he could seal it, that he could say, look, Jewish believers in Jerusalem, this financial gift is not just to help you out practically, but it's a sign, it's a validation of the worldwide rule of God who has now brought Gentiles and Jews together as one united people of God. And then once Paul had delivered the gift to Jerusalem, well, he tells us that the believers in Rome, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to visit you. As he says there in verse 28, notice it in your Bibles. I shall go by way of you to Spain, but I know that when I come to you, I shall come in the fullness of the blessing of the gospel of Christ. And so this is some of the historical stuff which is taking place. We're kind of unpacked. What are you talking about, Paul? What are you actually writing about a couple of thousand years ago in this closing part of your letter to the Romans? That's those are the historical specifics. But now we kind of open the door a little bit here. We open the door and behind those historical specifics of Jews and Gentiles in the first century, we can draw a principle that directly applies to us today. And that principle that applies directly to us today, it has to do with gospel interdependency. Or we could put it this way. We could say the principle that applies to us today is partnership in the gospel of Jesus Christ. You see, <clears throat> there's something very important about remembering that as Christians and as the church, we are merely one part of a whole. In other words, no Christian or no Christian church is to try to go it alone. No Christian or no Christian church is to try to seek to exist without the, the, the wider fellowship of the greater universal body of Christ. You see, when a Christian or a Christian church, when they isolate themselves, the disadvantage actually goes both ways. You see, the Christian or the church, they get to miss out on the blessing or the encouragement that's going to come from others. It's interesting to think, right? Think about that for a moment. Jerusalem, they are there. They thought, hey, we've got it all. Forget those Gentiles. We are, we are the people of God. But in doing so, they're kind of cutting themselves off from the blessing that others could come and bring to them. And fortunately, the Gentile churches didn't wait for them to come to grips with this or come to a, the, the, the theology in their own understanding. They went, and they, they went and made partnership and sought to make partnership with the church there despite some of the hang-ups that they had in their thinking. But the point is this. When a Christian or when a church isolates themselves, they are missing out on the blessing that can come to them from others. But on the other side, when a Christian when a church isolates themselves from the, the wider universal body of Christ, well, 
others miss out on the blessing and encouragement that can come from them. It's helping us to kind of get in our thinking here going, hang on a second. We spend so much time and so much effort a lot of times in thinking, how can we as Redemption Church get to a place of strength? And can I just say, that is a, a worthy and a noble and a much needed kind of aim and priority for us as a church. We want to be making sure that we are going from strength to strength within our, within our local church body right here. But there's one thing we need to understand, and that is we don't have everything that God may want to bless us with, and we may have more than what we need, so that can actually be a blessing to other people. Are we getting that? Are we understanding that? So, so in other words, it's saying, yes, let's focus inwardly, but let's not focus inwardly only. You see, these ties of partnership, these ties of interdependency with churches, they're going to flow to and fro, right? We're going to go back and forth. We, we, make, we make partnership, we, we make ties, we have alliances, you might want to call you. We, want, we, we might want to have informal bonds of fellowship and, and ties with others. The blessing goes both ways. On one side, you may have spiritual blessings that are passed from one church to another church. Maybe that's the ministry of the word. Maybe that's counseling. Maybe that's evangelistic efforts. Maybe that's outreaches and so forth. And so maybe you've got spiritual blessings going from one place to the other. On the other hand, on the other side, there are material blessings that can be passed from, from one, one body to another body, such as practical help. How can we help you practically? Is there a financial need that we can assist you with in your gospel outreach, in your gospel ministry? Either way, when we look at what Paul is talking about here in today's passage, and when we read through the New Testament and see how it is that other churches in the New Testament times interacted with one another— the principle of gospel partnership is abundantly clear to see. It reminds us of the importance of seeking out connections that we can make with other like-minded churches, the importance of that. It reminds us of how important it is not just tending to our own spiritual and practical needs right here of our own church, but also having somewhat of a, a broader focus of being mindful of how we can support and encourage other churches as well. And can I just say this? <clears throat> God has truly blessed us as a church with a wealth of spiritual resource and a wealth of spiritual gifting among our members. While there are many churches and we're just struggling to try to find one other person to preach apart from the pastor. God has blessed our church with at least seven men who are apt to preach the word of God. While there are other churches that are struggling to find just one capable person to offer biblical counseling to its members, not only do we have accredited counselors within our church, but as mentioned a bit earlier on, we currently have seven, at least seven of our members who are actively in the process of becoming accredited biblical counselors. While there are many churches who are struggling to try to find help in training its members in evangelism, outreach, our members have the opportunity in-house for on-the-job training about six out of seven days every single week of the year. I mean, we could talk about our abundance in the, of, of music teams that we have here. Some people have tried to pull together one piano player. Our burden at the moment is trying to put together a third and fourth music team. You know, we could talk about graphics. We could talk about technology. We can talk about these various things that we have, the giftings and the re spiritual resource that we have as a church. And you see, this is what we need to understand in all this. Not only has God blessed us with an abundance of spiritual resource and a spiritual gifting for our own members, and for the sake of our own church, but God also continues to provide opportunities where we can take this from our church to be an encouragement to believers and churches outside of our fellowship as well. I mean, I think even over the last year, just the opportunities that we've had to partner with other churches in a 
sending men in our church to go and preach the Word of God on, on Sunday mornings. There's been multiple opp- opportunities where we've been able to be bless other churches in our, our region and even outside of Canterbury as well. I think about the opportunities that we've had even over the last year to partner with other churches and being able to help in providing biblical counseling to their members. We've had opportunities to partner with other churches and helping to train and equip the members in evangelism. We've had opportunities for us to organize citywide outreaches, both pro-life and evangelistic as well, and these, these things that we've managed to do to be a service to others, providing opportunities for those who are outside of our church. And to be honest, I can't help but think that this is only the beginning. I really do. There was a time when our church was just struggling to put together a, one, a, a Sunday morning service, but now there's by God's grace, there's an abundance. There's, there's a growing as people are growing in their giftings and, and, and as, as the number of our church is starting to increase in number here as well, we're starting to see, wow, not only can we care for the members in, in-house, but we are now entering into a season as a church where we can, in addition to in-house, we can be thinking outwardly as well. How can we be a blessing to others? How can we be reaching others with the giftings that God has stimulated and brought together within our church. And the interesting thing is that I know you, (laughs) I know the members in our church, and I know that this is a desire within your hearts. I know that you have a desire not just to build a a little kingdom here at Redemption Church, but instead I know that there's a, a great joy a great joy when our relatively smaller church can have a tre- be a tremendous blessing to others. This is a joy and a responsibility of what we can call gospel partnership. As we partner with other churches, there are bonds of fellowship that are being established. There are bonds of fellowship that are being maintained. And in case you're wondering, my friends, this is the way that it's meant to be. We're not meant to just grow old and holy together. We're not meant just to be a holy little huddle, keeping to ourselves, watching to see what's going on from a distance. But instead, we're taking care of things in-house, and we're taking that which we have here and exporting it, bringing it out, encouraging others for the wider universal body of Christ. Well, moving on from gospel partnership, we see this, you know, finding meaningful ways and building connections with other believers. Moving on from gospel partnership, verses 25 to 29, we come finally now to gospel prayer. And this is going to be in verses 30 to 33. So let us give our attention now to what it is that Paul is saying. We've shifted from gospel partnership. We're now moving on to what you might call another form of gospel partnership, and that is gospel prayer prayer. Notice how he puts it there in verse uh, 30. He says, Now I beg you, brethren, through the Lord Jesus Christ and through the love of the Spirit, that you strive together with me in prayers to God for me, that I may be delivered from those in Judea who do not believe, and that my service for Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints, that I may come to you with joy by the will of God and may be refreshed together with you Now the God of peace be with you all. Amen. I think it's very clear for us to see in these closing verses of chapter 15 that just how much the Apostle Paul truly valued the importance of prayer, intercessory prayer, praying for others. We see this in verse 30 where he says, in verse 30, notice there, he says, I beg you, that picture, what, is that, what picture do we have there? We have the picture of Paul figuratively being on his knees, praying like this, saying, I'm begging you right now. I beg you with this request for you Christians in Rome to pray for me, Paul says. In fact, Paul saw that intercessory prayer for his gospel ministry. It played a, a vital part in his own ministry struggles. And that those who were praying for Paul, he saw they were actually partnering together with him in those struggles that he was experiencing at that particular time. He saw, look, I'm going through a difficult time right now. Serving the Lord in ministry is not particularly an easy thing to do. 
but he knew that he didn't have to do it alone. He knew that he could call upon other believers that he knew. And he says, please partner with me together. We can do this together. I don't have to do this alone. You can partner with me through your intercessory prayers. And how do we know that? Well, look at it in there in verse 30. He asks them, he begs them, he says, strive together with me. In other words, help to carry the burden of the gospel ministry and the gospel outreach that I'm actually doing right now. The gospel partnership, strive together with me, he says there. And in many ways, gospel prayer, it's a costly part of gospel partnership. It really is. Partnership and prayer, they kind of go hand in hand together. Because praying for gospel ministries and for the sakes, sake of others, what is it going to take? What is it going to take for us to pray, to be committed to, to intercessory prayer for other gospel works? Well, number one, it's going to take time, right? It's going to take time. So that's kind of costly, isn't it? Number two, it's going to take intentionality. In other words, it's probably not just going to happen by itself. It's something that we need to be mindful of and say, yes, we, this is something that we want to incorporate into. And it's going to require an outward focus. It's not just looking inwardly and in what we are doing in our individual lives or even us as a church. It's having more of an outward kind of focus. And notice for Paul, he has three prayer requests here, doesn't he? Three prayer requests that he gives here. Three things that he's begging the Christians in Rome, please, please pray for me. Please partner with me. Please strive together with me in the struggles that I'm going through right now. And notice firstly in verse 31, Paul asks for prayer that he may be delivered, or that is rescued, from unbelieving Jews. That's the first thing. So he's talking about partner with me in terms of the opposition that's going to come against me. I mean, Paul had a big target on his back by non-Christian Jews. They hated his ministry. They hated the fact that he'd become a Christian. They hated his message, that his message was by salvation, by grace alone, and not by the works of the law. And they especially hated the fact that Paul taught a message that those who were, they considered to be fuel for the fires of hell, message that said both Gentiles and Jews could be saved. They hated him for that. And it's for this reason, what did they want to do to Paul? They wanted to capture Paul. They wanted to kill Paul. They wanted him dead. They weren't mincing their words when it came to this very thing. And, and sure enough, when we read through the book of Acts, when you read through chapters 21 to 23, what do you see? Paul eventually gets to Jerusalem with this financial gift. He finally gets there. And guess what happens? Well, sure enough, the non-Christian Jews in Jerusalem wanted to do what? Pat him on the back? No, they wanted to kill him. The Roman officials jumped in before they could do that. They took Paul into protective custody. They even heard that there was going to be an ambush that was going to be coming against Paul in order to ambush the Roman officials and take Paul and, and kill him. This is what they wanted to do. Of course, the Roman officials got hold of that scheme. They squashed that scheme. They, they made alternative plans. But I say all this because it's really interesting because this very prayer request that Paul is making right here to the Romans before he went to Jerusalem, that prayer was actually answered when he did finally get to Jerusalem. I just wonder how many of those Roman Christians were actually praying for him at that time, those Christians in Rome. I wonder how many took this letter to heart and go, you know what, I'm going to partner with the strivings of the Apostle Paul. And can you imagine the great joy that came? Imagine the great joy when they found out, wow, did you hear about the ambush? Did you hear about those crazy non-Christian Jews? They called the big ruckus in the city there to the point the Roman officials had to come and you know, take Paul into protective custody. Can you imagine the joy? Can you imagine the joy that they would have missed out on if they hadn't engaged in intercessory prayer? They would have heard the story and go, oh, that's interesting. So Paul got out safe. Huh. How about that? That's what they would have thought of. But think of the joy. Think of the joy they would have missed out on if they hadn't have prayed for him. But the joy they get to receive to go, God is answering prayer right now. I'm partnering with these people who are involved in gospel ministry and my prayers are being heard by God and God is answering these certain prayers. And so this is the first thing that he asks prayer for, that I would be delivered or rescued from the harm of unbelieving Jews. But notice secondly, in verse 31, there's a second thing that he prays for, and that is that his service for Jerusalem would be acceptable to the saints. What is he talking about? 
What is he talking about? His service to the saints in Jerusalem. Well, Paul mentions his service here. It's, it's, It's referring to the combined financial gift for the Gentiles. That was his service. That's what he was coming with. He was coming there with that. And he's praying that it would be acceptable. What Paul is asking is that, please pray that when I get to Jerusalem, that the Jews there would actually see and receive the gift and see the significance of this financial gift. After all, they're only going to accept the gift if they accept the fact that they are now in fellowship with those who are non-Jews through the gospel. They're only, only going to accept Paul's service to them through that financial gift if they now accept that they are not two peoples of God, but they are now a united people of God made up of both Jews and non-Jews. He's essentially praying that they would accept the truths that we've seen Paul talk about in this letter to the Romans. That's the second thing that he prays for. Number one, help me from opposition. Number two, help that maybe that my ministry goes well, that people would be able to see the significance of my ministry to them. And then the third thing that he asks prayer for, if you notice it there in verse 32, he prays that by God's will, somehow that Paul could come to the Christians in Rome with joy and that they would be refreshed together spiritually. It's interesting that when you read the storyline of the book of Acts, if you know, I'm talking a lot about the book of Acts at the moment. Anyone would think that we're studying through the book of Acts in our midweek Bible study, <laughs> which we are, by the way. We haven't got to the end yet. But in the end of the book of Acts, it's really interesting that, um, that you see that Paul did make it to Rome. Exactly like he, he, he prayed. Look, please pray that somehow I can make it to Rome so we can be spiritually refreshing together. And you read how Paul got to Rome. He got there in a way that he didn't expect. He got there in a way that he was carted off by Roman officials He was taken by Roman officials to Rome to hear his court case heard before Nero. And when he got to Rome, it says in the very last chapter of the book of Acts, it says there that he remained in there in Rome for two whole years while he was waiting trial before uh, before Caesar at that time. And it says there for two years, believers in Rome, they came and they went freely throughout that time as they encouraged each other in the word of God. So again, I say this because this prayer request was answered as well. It just didn't happen in the way in which they were praying. And so in the way that they particularly expected as well, I guess a little something in there for us is thinking, well, we want to make sure that when we pray, that we are praying for the broad thing and we're leaving the specifics in God's hands as to how it is that he wants to fulfill that. We're praying broadly and going, Lord, please Allow for this to happen. And we might want to pray specifically on certain things, but we want to hold the specifics lightly, knowing that, you know what? God might just answer that prayer that we are praying for in our lives right now in the way that we never expected it to actually happen. And so it was for the Apostle Paul. Well, similar to gospel partnership, behind the scenes of the specifics, the, the historical specifics. You know, we've looked at some of the history here to say what was actually going, trying to understand the passage in its context. But behind that, we can draw a principle which directly applies to us right here today. And that principle has to do with the importance of partnering in ministry, partnering in missions with other believers through intercessory prayer. It has to do with the principle of the importance of being intentional when it comes to setting aside time to remember the gospel work, those outside of our church. When we think about it, gospel prayer is a necessity when it comes to partnering with other churches. I mean, think about this. We can't always get to every single other church around us for geographical reasons to partner with them. We can't do that physically, can we? But it's interesting that even when it's not possible to partner with them physically, it's interesting to think that we have the ability to partner with them spiritually. That is through prayer, bringing their needs before God in prayer. And going by what Paul is saying, and going by what Paul is saying in other, other passages throughout the New Testament as well, we are no less partnering with other believers in their ministry and their mission and their struggles and other areas through prayer than we would in any other practical kind of way as well. And so we don't want to de-emphasize 
you know, the importance of intercessory prayer for others. And what's great is that we have opportunities for intercessory prayer right throughout the week. We can partner with other believers and churches through prayer in our own personal quiet times throughout the week, can't we? Can we not include that in some of our personal quiet times? We're journaling and you know, writing down certain things, certain people that, other, certain churches or ministries that we can be praying for. We have the opportunity there. Perhaps we can have the opportunity in our midweek Bible studies when there's a time of prayer and you're praying together, saying, you know, let's pray for those who are outside of our church right now. Let's pray for others and, and the work that they're doing outside of there. We have the opportunity to partner with believers and churches through prayer right here in our corporate worship gatherings here on Sunday mornings. And, and what a blessing it is from time to time when we can think about others and think about what's happening in other areas and, and be praying into that. And of course, we can partner with others through prayer as a part of our Sunday afternoon services. It's just another opportunity on our Sunday afternoon service coming together to pray for other ministries, other mission outside of our church, and we can do so without the difficulties of trying to set aside that midweek evening a night. You know, every month, we used to set aside a, an evening in the meet, uh, midweek during the month for that. We can slide it right in there on a Sunday when it's the Lord's Day, the day is given to the Lord, and what's more, there's an opportunity between 4 and 5 p.m., once a month where we get to go and one, once a month it's just focused in on prayer and we have opportunity to gather around and be praying with other believers here for other ministries outside of here. And so I say all this because it's not just some lofty idea going, let's just pray for the world, you know, let's just pray and, and then just kind of leave it at that and you go, how am I going to apply that? There are opportunities day to day, there are opportunities week to week, there's opportunities month to month if we are intentional about that. And I can't help but wonder, <clears throat> I think about it from God's, I wonder what it's like from God's perspective. You know, what is the blessing of intercessory prayer from God's perspective? For us, it's just kind of like, uh, another hour on a Sunday afternoon, <laughs> I just want to go home. <laughs> you know, I've got to think about the logistics of trying to get there or trying to remember this and everything else a lot of times we think about intercessory prayer on a purely human level but think about what it must look like from God's perspective when he sees his people praying together he doesn't see disconnected little local bodies that are isolated from one another but instead he sees those bodies with connections of partnership with connections of bonds of fellowship of communion with one another from this person to that church to that church to this church to that church. It's not a divided body, but he looks down and he sees both practically and spiritually and prayerfully his church functioning as a body in the way that God really intends for it to function. And I leave us with that thought to think about that for a moment because that's, that's really the idea that we want to take from today. We want to be the body of Christ. And yes, there, that, it looks like one way individually as a local church, but let us think more than just our local church. Let us think about what bonds and what fellowship and what connections that we can be making to others all around and how others can be making connections with us as well. And so as we bring this study now to a close, I want us to think about a couple of things. I want us to think, first of all, gospel partnership, gospel prayer. Gospel partnership, how can we best be supporting those in ministry and missions outside of our church? What is your part to play in that? How can you be involved? And becoming a member of this church in this particular season that we find ourselves in as a church right now, it's a really exciting time because it's not just having to work on the foundation of the church. The foundation of the church has been established over the last 15 to 20 years and a lot of blood, sweat, and tears have gone into that. And our church is functioning very, very well. Our church is functioning well. It's functioning the way in a biblical way. And we have a good, solid, biblical foundation upon which our church has now been established by the grace of God. And we're so grateful to the grace of God for that. But guess what, my friends? You now get to play a part in building upon that foundation. Part of that is inwardly serving, using your giftings right here within the church. But could it be that part of that is having somewhat of an outward focus? 
uh, maybe evangelistically, maybe in the ministry of the word, maybe in the ministry of counseling, maybe in the ministry of outreach. What is your part to play? What is your part to play in gospel partnership? It's an exciting time to be part of this church right now because we're getting to a point where we can really start to have more and more of an outward focus. We can maybe be that church and become that church where a counseling ministry just springs out, not just for our own members, but that could it be that God might have for us here at Redemption Church? that the vast majority of our baptisms here by God's grace might be those who have come to faith through a, a counseling outreach to others who are in our community? Could it be that the churches which are, which are struggling and limping, limping along with, without the ministry of the word, could it be that more and more that people are raised up to take the word of God on uh, the pulpit and, and through the preaching? How does that look evangelistically? How does that look Outreach-wise, what are the opportunities that we as a church can get behind that and be able to export some of, the, some of the grace that God has given to us right here for the wider good of the body of Christ? And of course, as we think of gospel partnership, how can we be praying in an intercessory kind of way for those as well? There's some of you here this morning that might be thinking, Jason, you know what, I, I don't know if I've got enough energy in me right now. You know, maybe I, I, don't, I don't know if I've got enough time in my season right now to be able to do these, this partnership physically. But what about prayerfully? What about partnering with those who do have the time or the capacity or the energy in a season of life who are actually out there on the front lines? Can you be part of the intercessory prayer, specifically striving together, as Paul would put it here, for those who are doing that work of the ministry? And what is that going to look for you? How can you incorporate that into your life? Is it going to be in your personal devotional life? Is it going to be saying, hey, at a midweek Bible study, why don't we pray for this outreach or this mission or this church? Is it for the men who pray in, here on a Sunday morning? Is it incorporating it into your prayers here, that you're praying for those outside of our church when we come together corporately? Is it maybe you committing to coming to the Sunday afternoon service? where you can come together and say, you know what, I might not be able to pray for anyone else outside of our church for the whole month, but I know that at least one time, the, the, second, uh, the third Sunday of every month, I know we're going to be praying, and I know we'll be praying for others, and that's a time that I can incorporate intercessory prayer within my, lives, my life. The question is, how are you going to do it? How do you plan to incorporate that so that you can partner with others through this ministry of intercessory prayer? Let's just close now with a word of prayer, and we're just going to ask that God would help us with this. So let's now come before him with this request. Father, thank you for your word to us this morning. Thank you for the way that you've gifted us, that you've brought so much spiritual wealth and um, giftedness to our church here. And I do pray more and more that we would catch that vision, that we would see ourselves as part of uh, uh, this next season of our church where we, yes, caring for one another, caring for the members in our church, but at the same time, looking for opportunities, thinking about opportunities, being prayerful concerning opportunities of how we can be a blessing to others as well. Lord, we know that we need it. It's not just one way. We know we need it coming back our way as, as well. You know our spiritual needs. You know our material needs. You know our financial needs. And, and when we recognize that you will supply all of our needs. But in the meantime, Lord, help us, give us grace, help us to see the, 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 the partnerships that you want us to be you know, engaging in. Help us to be an outward-focused church, not just an inward-focused church. And Lord, help us to part of that ministry to be through that of intercessory prayer that we're reminded of both individually and also corporately to be praying for other gospel works that you are doing throughout our city, throughout our nation, throughout our world. We ask for your help with us in Jesus' name. Amen.